All right, so we are going to go over a video today. Uh, the lighting's really weird here. I just moved to a new apartment, so I'm kind of experimenting with stuff, and I didn't realize how much of a crime scene this uh, shooting and lighting would look like. Anyway, some of it's out of focus. Some of it's like the, there's just no information from the lighting. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm already getting into this here. I'm sketching out. I'm just we're just going to do a spirit. The main point of this one here is I'm using a sycamore wood. Um, it may not be sycamore, it may technically be a London plane tree, uh, which is very similar, I'll get into that later. But this is a medium hardwood. I've been talking uh, with a lot of guys about um, tear outs, and I've done a video on it recently. And it, one of the solutions to tear outs is um, I suggest to go to a hard, slightly harder wood. And uh, you need to get one that's close to what you're going to carve because taking off. Um, stock material, rough out material, whatever they call it, um, taking off a lot of material with your knife and army tools is going to be very frustrating with with any wood that's harder than basswood, even with basswood. So anyway, um, sycamore is a great kind of in-between um, wood that's not exactly as hard as uh, an oak or, or an ash or something. Um, and basically, I don't know, when I when I started messing around with it, um, I was just like, man, I don't know, this is my favorite wood, like, it, just, it just, it solved all the problems that I've been having with basswood, um, you know, because you, you, you look at these projects or guys that are carving online and whatnot, and in books, and you can't simulate what they're doing, you're getting all these tear outs, and your eyeball, you know, you're just, uh, all your eyes are turning into these uh, just gouged out holes and all this stuff. So I wanted to show what kind of detail you can get pretty easily with the sycamore. Um, of course, what would happen in this one eventually is that it's the same thing that's going to happen with any with any wood. Um, you know, once you get used to the detail level, you're probably going to push that, and then you're still going to have tear outs at some at some size. Um, so anyway. Uh, you'll you'll be able to see here, like um, it, besides the detail that you can get with this stuff, um, it just feels different. And and there's not a, the scale of woods is not doesn't just go from soft to hard. They have these very different kind of qualities and characteristics depending on how they dried, what tree they are, and, and also again what species they are. So uh, I really like sycamore, especially when it's not too dried. Um, it's something that you can get in a lot of places in the world for free um, off the street and. Um, and get it down to size. It doesn't crack too bad uh, when it's drying. So um, you can see here I'm getting I'm, my basic kind of uh, shape out. Uh, this is kind of a, a corner face, but basically what I'll do because this is a piece that came off of um, I think it's still left over from Hurricane Sandy actually. Um, you know, it's a natural piece of wood. Um, you'll have these large logs and so what I'll do is I'll split them up <clears throat> into these wedges and these wedges kind of make these basically what will set up for a kind of corner face um, as you can see what I'm doing here and it, it, this is not quite straight grain it's a little bit curved um, but that that will go will work with that to kind of have a bit of a flow of uh, kind of overall curve with this face um, I'm trying to show you there that um, <laughs> my hands are starting to shake there. I'm trying to show that like I'm I'm pushing towards myself there uh, with this cut, but um, with my thumb I'm pushing against that knife hard enough so that if it slips, uh, there won't be any uh, cutting of the hand. And so, uh, yeah, we can't see this one very well. There were some other issues here was that um, with the lighting, besides it being out of focus and whatnot. Um, I kept this. It had it had dried. I this was in my last apartment. It was just winter time. This stuff dried like way too much. So I had to keep soaking it down. You see, I'm doing it here. I'm patting it down with alcohol and water instead of spraying it, and um, that made the lighting even worse. And then uh, sycamore has this very interesting texture and kind of grain pattern um, that you'll be able to see later on. It's actually over exaggerated in some of the video. Um, it's this kind of checker pattern weirdness um, but anyway you'll get the idea at the end when it's not wet half wet and half dry it's it's much easier to see so 
what was I going to say earlier? Oh yeah, besides the detail, it's just that, um, cause I think, you, you know, depending on your patience and who you are, you can get better detail out of a basswood or whatever wood it is than, you know, somebody else. But the point is, is that like with sycamore, you don't have to be so careful. Like you can just push your V tool around, you know, whichever way you want for the most part and get that shape that you wanted and there's no issues and um, you know it's basically it's, it's, it's the tear out ratio you know of that kind of before uh, and before and during the cut of a blade there's a pushing on the on the fibers of the wood and that uh, when you change your wood to a harder wood or something that very specifically will take um, cross grain and uh, with the grain cuts it will take so much more pressure and so much more of a blunt tool for that ratio to be um, basically that the tool is tearing out so um, I really would suggest this for a lot of people especially if you've been at the basswood for a while it's kinda like you know in a lot of practice um, like for sports or whatever like say for baseball the they do the lead weights on the on the uh, the bat, or they do a really heavy uh, baseball to practice with. And then when you go to the real thing, uh, it feels very light, and you can swing it uh, very well. So after go after being with bass, doing work with basswood for so long, even if you're screwing up, when you get to the sycamore, uh, you'll just see things happen so much easier. And um, it's really nice to see that, especially if you're getting frustrated. It's a good way to change things up. Anyway, again. Uh, it does cause problems when you're trying to do large amounts of wood removal um, because it's um, it's frustrating really quickly. Um, for the most part, most of these cuts look like they're they're happening pretty easy, but um, it's it, you know very sharp knives and um, I'm slicing very thin pieces off. Um, you, you're gonna much more quickly be overpowered by. Uh, cuts that get too deep than you will with basswood and so there's also that kind of you know alternate side of, of going to this wood and then going maybe back to basswood and then you kind of see you know the, the special parts of the basswood you know and where that is um, so anyway I just wanted to show you guys and because we mostly almost always use basswood or I use something that's similar to it that's very soft um, and Again, there's there's this kind of, even with this, there's this kind of, you know, when you're looking at somebody who's been carving for, for longer, you know, you do want to strive for that, uh, what they're doing and some of that stuff, but um, you don't want to beat yourself up when you're not getting to that point. And basically, you know, when I, I know for me still when I, uh, when I try to try to do stuff that uh, from the carvers that I like, uh, I get frustrated pretty easy. Um, you know, not being able to get the wood to do what I want it to do. So, I just wanted to show you guys something different. There's other stuff out there, and again, this is also another wood. Or this is this is a great wood if you want to get wood on your own that um, is not from um, you know a commercial company, or you know that uh, you don't want to have a, a lasting effect on environment or whatever how do you want to word that you know um, it's not even this that because we don't generally carve that much wood but you know the whole carving of wood is definitely there's a frame of mind to it you know, there's a certain zen to it and it's and it's fun to uh, get your own wood and um, and carve it so this is an easy one to go get pieces of it is a little hard to split because of uh, it's not so bad to cut uh, like with the chainsaw or saw cross grain get your logs but when you split those logs it does not split very well um, even when you have like a piece that doesn't have any knots or anything um, but this kind of it's a trade-off that you have when you go to a wood that has really good cross grain as it doesn't split very well so like pine for example has awful cross grain cutting it's very linear strength based wood but you can put an axe, you know, whatever, split it down the grain extremely easily. And um, again, the woods are all kind of different. There's no uh, 
black to white grayscale. Um, they all have drawn characteristics, but it's pretty hard to uh, split this stuff up. It, it's really expensive, by the way, too. Anything that's not commercially produced, like basswood, or basically there is basswood, and then there's every other wood. So sycamore you can get for basically for free off the street. And, um, you know, if it's going to have to go through a wood company, you're going to be paying pretty pricey, uh, quite a bit of money for small chunks. And they may be over-dried, and, and who knows um, what else. So... I guess if you don't have a lot of experience with axes and the cutting down and all this stuff, um, then just go get a piece that's close to um, what you want to do. Um, a lot of the faces that I've done that are like this are, uh, are just little limbs that are maybe like about an inch and a half to an inch and three quarters diameter, you know, so, which is basically what those corner faces are that I do in the basswood. And um, and then it's already rounded, so you, they're basically ready to go. You just have to take a little bit of bark off, and then you start going. Um, you just have to make sure that the bottom is flat so it'll stand up on its own. So I'm doing a lot of this with a knife, and then kind of going back and forth. And, boy, this is out of focus. This is bad. And the color is ridiculous. Whatever. Um, well, in the whole video, you're just going to see this awful Tupperware in the background. Now that I've pointed it out, too. Anyway, yeah, I just moved a second time for in, th in three months. The last place was a nightmare, but well, whatever. Um, so, again, back to this. This is basically what you see me do on, on like, all my faces. Like, I get the, the brow line out, and then I start to get that nose in there. There you see I start to do my first cut for the bottom of the nose. Um, I make the nose very large because, especially in the beginning, because you can always bring it up, and... Um, you can't necessarily bring it back down and, and it's kind of part of my styles that I generally have very large noses like you see me here using here um, flex cut uh, travel kit it's like the roll it does okay as long as the wood's got some alcohol in it and whatnot um, I have to push a little bit harder because that steel flexes because it's not a, a rod forged thing but um, Again, I just moved, so I don't really have all my tools with me, and um, I haven't quite resharpened everything. All my tools got like damaged in the move, and they're kind of a mess. So I just used whatever I had around in this one. And anyway, so yeah, I make the I make the nose too long and too wide in the beginning. You see that right here, and you could use that, you could go with that, but um, it's very easy to kind of look at that and then say, okay, I want to cut this down here a little bit. I want to cut down here, and. Um, it gives you much more control, you know. Again, it's it just goes with that philosophy of in carving that you can always remove, but you can't add anything. So you you plan some features uh, like the nose that can be shortened, uh, especially in the early periods. You can shorten them and not have any repercussions. You know, not all features you can you know just keep removing and make smaller or move over a different place. But the nose you really can, and the nose really sets up the rest of the face. So, um, again, I kind of do this brow line at first at the top, and whether it's a, if it's a round, a round piece or a triangle or this piece, which is kind of you could say it's a triangle. I mean, not a triangle, but a corner a corner face. The deeper this the uh, brow is going to go, the wider the eyes are going to be. Okay, because that that wood is going out steadily further out so the deeper it is the more space is going to be for the eyes so that kind of gives you this idea of okay this is how, how you know large the eyes are or how much space is going to be for them and then you can bring the the nose down so that it doesn't look like he's like cross-eyed or he's got these huge eyes that are that are right there and um it's also from you know i, I don't just do one and then the other um, i kind of go back and forth I'll, I'll do a little bit of this brow and then I'll bring the nose down and then I'll, I'll actually go deeper again because I'll say you know what I need more I need my eyes to be wider and and for the most part as I've, if you guys watch my videos um, doing more passes if you have wood behind it it's usually better it's gonna make your you know features a lot deeper and more pronounced and generally better so just go ahead and do that and and that's also some of that's going to be when you make mistakes, you know, in the eyes, which does happen on this one. 
um, somewhat, and the nose, like the shape. I've got too much of a ski slope nose, so you'll see that I go on that the top of the nose, the bridge there. Actually, I don't know if that, that's not the bridge. The top, right, built in between the bridge and the the brow line, make that like totally deeper, and um, try to get a better shape on that nose. Um, yeah, it also when you make features extra large, and you kind of are in this mode of just kind of relaxing, um, and 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 seeing what happens as you shave it down. Uh, the nose you can kind of shave down different shapes on each pass and that's where you're going to discover you know, how you get these you know specific looks and features that you might like and then um, when you get to the where you're you know the, the wood's supposed to be this the size of the nose uh, then you can then reproduce that again or often like times where I do if I find a place where I like it then I just leave it uh, because again we're not reproducing life here uh, we're just, you know, we're having fun. These are supposed to be stylized. They're spirits. Um, it's okay if the nose is super big. You know, it's not a big deal. Um, it often adds to it. Uh, because humans' noses are pretty small. Um, so to have them described in a... Uh, have them described in, in, in a 3D um, way like this, they, they just, I don't know... It's not like it's lying. It's actually it's it's funny. There's um, this fine line in between, um, kind of lying and, and not lying. Uh, there was a, what is a documentarian name? Uh, he's this Russian guy. He would do documentaries though, and he would he would screw with stuff, and people would get pissed off. And he would often say that you have to lie sometimes to really tell the truth. And it's an interesting thing because, it, it, specifically concerning this, uh, as I think about like the noses and being too large and how that works better than the actual real reality of the, the nose is because um, our minds don't deal in reality for the most part. They deal in this uh, modeling of you know how they see the world and this characterization and, and whatever software and um, whatever language they use to see the world. And again, that's one of the special things about art and carving and um, doing this kind of stuff is that other people see, they get to see the inside of somebody else's mind, some of those mechanisms for how they see, how we see people. You know, the nose is, is overly large, it's overly whatever, yet it still looks right. And our brains kind of get this ironic kind of chuckle out of that, this kind of... Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think that's generally what art is supposed to be after a certain point. Um, you know, when photography came around, uh, painting was uh, thought to be dead. It was going to be over with because at that time, my painting was used for uh, portraits, and that was about it. And when photography came around, um, it really ended up freeing up painting so that it wasn't for reality anymore. And it was for, um, you know, projecting what happens inside of our minds and all this other stuff and um, it's easy to forget you know how how things have evolved in, in art and in in the way that our minds um, kind of see things I know for me when I was growing up I didn't I hated art for the most part I you know I went to art schools high school and, and college and stuff and I didn't understand any of it and um, I just didn't understand that, that this had just been done, you know, that these guys were just kind of going through these, um, you know, like, hey, like, it, we were just coming, evolving from doing uh, totally realistic paintings to, hey, we're going to do one that has some weird lighting, or we're going to have a certain stylized kind of face, or, you know, we're going to have a certain, you know, let's just do this in lines, and then... You know, is you know, that is that's art, and then that kind of creates fine art. Is that they get to this point where uh, you're pushing on what the mind will still recognize as uh, as anything, as an expression of anything. I'm getting way off here. I'm sorry. This is a bit of a long carving. Um, 
and I've gone over the face before so many times that I'm not really sure what else to say here. Um, you can see he looks a little bit like dorky, right? So one of the things we're going to fix about him, he looks a little bit like 80s, and that's basically because there's no sides to his face. So what needs to happen for that is that his... Uh, to fix this look right here is everything needs to get deeper so that there's more room for his eyes and then there needs to be a border around his face we need to frame his face using um, his hairline and his ears and his beard and that can be done a little bit by you know again put, putting back where his cheekbones are and his forehead but um, some of it can happen on the side a little bit of a three-quarter and you'll see where that happens uh, and it starts to make this look a little bit more, um, uh, I don't know, respectable or, or not so much just like a, uh, I don't know what to explain. <clears throat> he, he rem I guess he reminds me of like these weird 80s stylized uh, cartoons and, uh, and even animations where there wasn't this uh, roundness to the face. When you're messing about with uh, just a knife, you guys need to remember here um, how how deep your knife is going. Um, I've been trying to do more and more with just a knife, and uh, they're just easier to sharpen. A lot of people maybe don't have access to whatever, and it, it maybe describes the process a little more. But um, even with this harder wood, you're still gonna have to worry about the whole nose popping off if. You've been making your cuts, you know, your little V cuts on the side of the nose. If they've been going too deep, there's not, they're going to be undercutting the entire nose, and some something's going to put pressure on it, and the whole thing's going to pop off. So what we're doing right here, what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to get the side of the, the cheeks in. We're, we're basically starting the process of what I was talking about, of getting this uh, roundness to the face, so that it's not just kind of um, straight to the the brows. In the front, there's not just the front and, and sides, but that there's um, there's basically this uh, third dimension that's like kind of the three quarter side of the face again, um, and most of that will pop out again. Framing the face with the beard and then the hair. You can see there again. I'm demonstrating a little bit of um, it be, when you're close to the nose, basically, uh, especially with these harder woods. Um, you're doing the beard or whatever, uh, you do a um, sweeping cut that, that turns the knife so that it, when it slips or whatever, it's, it's just going to spin instead of um, going for bam into the bottom of the nose because um, it's going to cut it off. So you see right here, this this what I'm doing right here, these just little V cuts, this is what really starts to deepen the face and give it some more dynamic whatever. And, and what I've been doing a lot after a certain point, uh, I started doing this, that I don't just go straight in or down, but I actually go up. And this does kind of give this specific nose that I do a lot of the times. And um, it's really only in my more detailed work um, in the Sycamore. And uh, I forget, one of my clients called it something. Um, I don't know. It's just like a, a very uh, kind of more very serious royal kind of nose um, you can see there as it starts to cut down and it doesn't mean that the the nostrils you can see right there it changed it makes it makes his nostrils look like they're flaring on the stage left side that doesn't necessarily need to happen when that goes up oh we've changed okay this is even more out of focus worse color right here we are going to frame the face out with the top of the hair and I'm just gonna make some stop cuts here and you'll see here this will start to make a big difference um, you know he kind of he starts to remind me of this that that look I was talking about this 80s thing I don't know I think it was like a McDonald's or Burger King thing and there was like um, the moon was singing like playing the piano about Big Macs <laughs> I don't remember I don't remember what that was at all and I don't want anybody to look at advertising from McDonald's so we're going to shut up about that you see there I got the top alright so 
what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to cut into the side to get that side of that hair. All right. So you can do it just round. I'm going to mess with something else for a second here. When you look at somebody's hairline, there's kind of generally like say, some geometry that goes on. Um, you can get away with just a round kind of from the top of the forehead uh, and follow that down. Especially when there's a beard, it just kind of can go straight down and just outside the side of the eye um, and then start to come in at the bottom of the cheek and then meet at the bottom of the nostril. So there's kind of this um, little circle going on the forehead and the nose and the eyes um, as you see in a lot of my work. Uh, but in this one we'll do a little bit more um, and, and it doesn't it can be a little bit ambiguous um, as you'll see that will happen here. Okay so here I'm going to start it here and I actually didn't go a whole lot deeper again as I told you guys earlier. Really it, in doing this we're thinning his, the uh, skull uh, a little bit so that it will um, make the hair wider than that. So Okay so we're proportionally making um, this happened by making the, the skull smaller uh, to make it a little more three-dimensional and, and get that stuff in there. And you see here doing this side and, and again this is this is all raw wood um, you see over on the sides here this is from when I split it and again this wood doesn't split very well so uh, this is kind of what happens. You could do this with your V-tool if you want. Um, you can see this, that also it, it frames out that cheekbone a little bit and really from there you can just draw it down and then come over into um, where the beard starts to tilt over. I'll do that in a second here, hopefully on camera. Yeah, some of this stuff had to be edited out because I'm, um, it may not seem like it, but I'm really close up um, because this guy's face is like the size of a quarter and it was really hard to keep it inside the camera lens. I don't have a monitor where I see what's going on. I kind of look over every once in a while, but a lot of stuff it's again it's out of focus or I just start going off of the uh, out of the shot okay so you can see here I'm getting the top of the the mustache and I'm also thinning out the nose a little bit as I'm seeing that I'm bringing the skull thinner that it can take that 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 nostril can come in a little bit and uh, still be a very large uh, attractive European nose you see it's white under there, that's where the alcohol is not soaked into yet, the alcohol and water. Uh, if you haven't watched any of my other videos for some reason, the alcohol and water is a 50% mix of alcohol and water. I usually do it in a spray bottle. Um, I haven't found my spray bottle because I moved, so I've just been mixing it in water and soaking it in there. And actually what happened here, uh, you don't really get to see it. There you see I start my eyes a little bit. Okay, and let me shut up because here's here's where I'm doing the side of the face here, basically thinning the skull out to give a uh, more three dimensional look to the whole face. Um, you know, we're just doing the kind of basically the hairline to frame out this face. And one of the things about the using a harder wood, especially like this one that has good cross grain, is you can go against the grain a little bit, and it's much more forgiving. Um, you saw in those cuts as with the V tool, when you do a diagonal, you're going to be one of the, one of the cuts is going to be going against the grain, and that didn't cause any problems. So, I'm not sure where I'm cutting there because there's this these V tools are really wide angled. So let's see if I'll connect this up here. Um, you can see where it, like I kind of did the top of the forehead; it's mildly curved. You can make it more geometric if you want to, and you can make it higher or lower if you want to. Especially if there's a hat. If there's a hat, then you want to make it um, extremely low. You know, make it like right above the brow line, if not on the brow line. But um, you know, then after you do that kind of that part, which is kind of its own curve, you go this much more steep uh, down cut. All right, all right, okay. We're doing the mustache now. Um, this is another thing here where we kind of left because we were doing the, the nose. It's another thing that can be very low and can be brought up as time goes on. You can see it's also it's very dangerous for the nose to be doing the mustache. Um, so be careful with that. Um, you know, use a knife if you need to. 
you can see right here I'm using the V tool to make the shape of that kind of part at the top of the uh, the mustache which is sometimes there it's not really necessary it's interesting a lot of the wood spirits the ones that I do other people do the, the noses are very long and the, the beards are extremely long and and that where the uh, spaces for the mouth that I was just carving um, it's so low even when you carve in a, a, a lower lip like the mouth is actually there it doesn't seem to bother anybody's brain that looks good uh, even though there's no way that somebody's mouth would be that low um, they'd be I don't know So this guy's looking pretty angry, by the way, which is generally what happens in my carvings, but especially with the sycamore ones. Yeah, even when I when I try to do happy guys, they still have this like creepy intensity, and uh, I struggled with that early on because it kind of creeped people out. And then at some point, I was like, you know what? Whatever. That's how it goes. Plenty of other people have happy spirits. Anyway, um. Oh, so I remember what I was going to say earlier. So um, I keep soaking this thing down and I work on it for, um, uh, this video is only like an hour, but it was like a, an extremely long time. And uh, it's a really hard balance that you're, when you when you use the alcohol mix with the water, right? Uh, because it has to soak in deep enough for whatever cut you're making, where the tear outs are happening for to, to help that, which is kind of deep. And um, if you keep soaking it over and over again, it's eventually going to be like waterlogged kind of, and it's going to actually make the tear outs happen even more. Um, so it is, again, it's a balance. Uh, you may need to let it dry out for uh, a certain period of time. Again, um, this is probably mostly going to be a problem that like I have personally because um, I don't have patience and, um, you know, I get... Really focused when I carve and um, past the point of of being logical. Um, so I don't really know what to tell you about that, but it, it it can happen. It'll start to happen on the eyes and stuff. Like if you've already been soaking them down, doing features around them, and it gets getting wetter and wetter, then that that the wood fibers are going to be so malleable that they're going to push uh, more. Uh, before they get cut and that's exactly you know it, it changes that ratio of that uh, the push versus cut and what causes a tear out so um, you know you could do an eyelid or something and the eyelids clean up an eyelid and the eyelids are both soaked to the core they're gonna push over and then the knife is gonna cut and they're it's gonna or you're gonna finally start pushing and it's gonna tear it out and um, this basically ended up happening on this guy um, the uh, the video the the, vi the footage and everything was extremely long. And I'm showing you here kind of where we are with this guy. By the way, um, this is basically about it. Um, you know, we've got kind of everything in there. Everything after after this point is kind of uh, style and, and what you want to do. Anyway, but um, basically I edited. I just didn't put in like a lot of the last footage that happened with this guy because I basically did everything over again. Um, Again, I screwed up his eyes because I was just, you know, really set on it and um, ended up spending too much time. And there's not really any reason to show you guys me carving this twice, um, especially when a lot of it was okay in the, in the first place. Uh, another thing is I will show you a little bit of the eye carving up close. Uh, some of that's like on... Actually, it was up close, and it was it was still in frame and everything in focus. Uh, but there's there's some that you can't really see on this guy that because of the the shadows and whatnot. Um, so I did it on like another piece of wood on basically the most detailed eye I could do. I have another eye video which is on the more simple eye, which is basically when you're doing basswood and whatnot um, because it's just like a squint. So I did like kind of a much more complex eye, or the one that I've kind of figured out um, on my own. Uh, based off of a lot of other people's stuff um, but that's going to be on another video I'll put another link in here it'll be below um, and you guys can go check that out it'll be a really short video of just just doing the eye very complicated uh, I definitely could have worked with this guy um, and it's um, 
This guy's actually a little bit big for my sycamore stuff. I have like some other other carvings that I done in the past uh, when I was you know, off camera, no pressure, and um, you know had done much better detail, much better eyes and everything. So that didn't help when I was coming into this one, and um, so. Anyway, so I wanted to do that eye video because that's that's very specifically where a lot of a lot of the problems come up when, when in the detail stuff. You know, it's not really anywhere else. But you can see though that uh, besides the detail stuff, that there's a different look to the sycamore to these these hard, harder woods that the um, the cuts in the planes that the cuts create kind of um, stand up a lot more. Um, they don't they don't get rounded over and they, they get much more um you know again like the guys look much more serious and angular and it, it's it's i guess it's just detail on a level of like even when there's large cuts that there, there's a there's a cleaner cut even up to the edges um so here i'm starting to just shape a little bit more and what i basically do in the end here is i do some um swirling in his beard and um, I'm also what I've been messing with is instead of just using uh, the V tools, which is what I pretty much almost always used uh, up until recently, I, on beards and hairs, I just used the V tools. And um, even though early on I, I knew, like in the Harold Enlow book, he talks about using different um, different uh, kinds of like a you know a little veneer, different sizes of veneers and V tools for for hair and also um hair okay Harold Enlow uh who does the uh he does like a face carving book he's more of like an old school Swedish carver he's he kind of has this kind of baseline thing of like you know okay you're going to use the super detailed v tools which have the sharper v um for like the more um angular like men and stuff and then when you want to have like a softer like woman um, or just, or if it's a man, whatever, it's just like a softer feel in, in whatever it's in the anatomy is to match with the, the face, then you use more of like a, a veneer to just kind of shape it out. Now, if you look at Sean Sipa's stuff, um, and again, both these guys are kind of like the, the really big influences on me, um, especially Sean Sipa and the way that he's been able to catch a specific style. Right, Harold Inlow is kind of like more of a technique guy, and and uh, Sipa is more of like um, I don't know. He's he's got he's caught something in a jar. It's a little a little bit more special, and um, it's still in technique. But anyway, uh, you know he'll do these weird twisted beards, and they they look like they're flowing with the wind, and they're so amazing. And they're they're basically mostly done with a U U tool, a V tool. A veneer tool, uh, which is going to be like the number eleven. Uh, I'm saying a U tool because the number eleven is that V. Uh, oh my God! I'm going to shoot myself. I just keep saying V because I'm saying, meaning to say veneer. I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. Um, it's it's the uh, the most curved sweep, and then it has walls on it. Okay, um, so that it looks like a U shape. And um, people say that it was used to do veins at some point. That's why it was called a veneer. But um, I don't think that's why. It, it doesn't really make sense um, to me. But anyway. Um, so I've been looking at they, they, it doing some beards that are like kind of curly and whatnot. Um, I tried to replicate SEPA style for a long time. And uh, I got close, but not just not quite there. And uh, at some point I was watching a video when I was... I don't know if you guys have seen my pipe carving videos. I'm like doing um tobacco pipes, like little wood spirits on the front of them. I'm watching this guy in uh I don't know what country. He's carving one out of um meerschaum, which is this weird clay stone stuff that comes out of the earth and it's like very soft so that um you can soak it in, in some water or something. And you don't even have to carve it with like the edge of a tool. You can like turn the, the tool to the side and kind of get these shapes. Anyway, it, I saw this very unskilled guy doing a, like this extremely luscious beard that was like super curvy. 
And that was just that point where I was like, man, that it's a mechanism, it's a gimmick, you know, which a lot of things are in carving and art, but when you're good at it, it doesn't look like a gimmick, and, and you do take it beyond a gimmick, but I was like, oh, okay, that's not just because these guys are um, doing, I don't know, I, I just, I, in sculpture, you see these beards that are curly, and you know, they're like these amazing beards, and it's very hard to replicate those in wood. So I saw these like smaller ones. I was like, all right, I'm going to try that. And I looked at some other stuff. And it's basically you can kind of make this um, this full body beard look with um, the number 11, the veneer tool, doing kind of uh, these twists and shaping with that. And then you go in very sparingly with a, a detailed V tool um, to kind of, you know, hint at some actual hairs in there. Uh, I know this makes sense, but... Basically, what I would suggest until you start looking into that stuff is that you just use V tools, or if it's a U tool, you know, um, whatever. But keep it straight, and if it's got curve in it, do a very light curve that, that has, you know, a very um, distinctive amount of curve. Like it's a very, you know, just one to the bottom, or an S from the top to the bottom if you have a few inches. Um, the problem with doing any other curve that's like in in and out because side to side is one thing you can deal with that with the tools but when they go in and out like like a real beard does when it's curly is that the um the v tools all have to all these little hairs have to match up on these um the crevices on these little um half pipe crevices um because you can't have a V tool that goes in and then comes back out and is going against the grain is still going to be okay if you can even make that turn which it won't be able to so it's extremely hard to make this natural thing go happen so I would suggest making you know whatever whatever which way the grain is going that you make a just straight kind of V cuts and again if you want you know use the veneer tool number 11's um, and then slowly start to experiment with, um, you know, mild curves that happen so that there's a little bit of wind. Um, going into this other stuff, it starts to get extremely complicated and it takes up so much time. And like on this guy, like it works out, um, like because I leave a lot of the side raw and the back raw. But I remember early projects when it was a log, I would, I would, um, here's some of the progress, kind of where we are. And you can see the, uh, the grain. It's kind of weird grain. Again, he's half wet and he's half dry, and there's this weird lighting. So, and you see me do the eye here, um, and how how well it works with the sycamore. That I just kind of just shape it out, and it just works. If this was in basswood, everything would be tearing, be a mess. Um, and that's basically it right there. Anyway, yeah, with the with the the beards and the hair, um, just stick with simple stuff, and if it's taking too long again like I was when I was doing uh, sorry when I was talking about the logs I would spend so much time I would do this face in like half an hour and then I spend like another three to six hours doing the hair because there was so much space of doing all this hair and like filling in all this crap so figure out some sort of stylized thing don't bring it to the back if you have a you know a limb leave the leave the bark on the back and then leave it you know raw make it work like that um, and you can also do stylized, like you don't have to do super detailed hair, you can do much larger hair, and that also, and sometimes more looks like way cooler. Alright, so you can see here, like I'm just kind of like digging out this underneath this eyelid, and even I'm going to dig inside the eyelid right here. Which I, on basswood, it would never happen, especially on this size. You can look at my fingers next to this stuff and my fingers look gross because this is so up close like I'm I need to have a professional maybe even pass that professional freaking um, manicure before I do videos like this again but um, these, are, these are tiny eyes and um, basically like when you stick the tool in there this is a one millimeter tool you're kind of just like imagining the cut before you do it and then you know you kind of place it where you, you think you need to and then you kind of imagine that cut so here I'll do a little bit of the eyebrow to get some curve in the eyebrow, um, and also because this is a peak, um, you're going to do kind of, um, you know, 
you don't want to tear it out too much. So you, you basically do some a bunch of cuts in one direction, however the grain can take it on the top, and then on your next um, pass on you know below it, whether it's underneath like right here or it's on the top, you tilt it even more, and then that will look like an overall curve that's going on. That will bring that movement. Um, again it's one of those situations where because it's a peak you can't have a, a curve a cut that goes from top to bottom and everything be okay <laughs> you have to have the lines meet up again you see here how small this is and how I'm carving on the inside of the eyelids and on the tops and and everything's pretty much okay um, at least at this point this is before I've destroyed everything um, and uh, so I hope you guys give Sigmar a try or London plane tree. So the whole deal with the London plane trees, as I mess this up in front of you here, um, in America for the most part, and I think in some other places too, um, the sycamores couldn't deal with the um, what makes or breaks like a planting tree, city planting tree, is like if it can deal with smog, like the um, pollutants from the the, the cars, and um, it's like specifically in places like New York. It's going to be like um, the salt that gets put out in the winter is like extremely damaging to um, all of the uh, all the wildlife, wildlife, botany or whatever. So anyway, they mix the sycamore with a uh, oriental plane tree, I think it is. And um, they got this, what's generally called a London plane tree. And it's basically a sycamore, um, but it... Um, they're so hard to tell between um, the sycamore uh, and a London plane tree that it's it's basically impossible. You can be sure that one is a a tree that it's a London plane tree, but you can't be sure that it's a sycamore because uh, basically the London plane tree can reproduce all of the um, genetics of its. Uh, of its parent the sycamore so whatever you know distinguishing characteristics that the sycamore has um, a London plane tree can be um, projecting all of those um, so it gets a little confusing I've never even seen an oriental plane tree and I don't think it even bears with conversation it's like you know with some of those genes are just it's like hardly noticeable and and the woods I mean I've carved both sycamore and London plane tree and and they're they're hardly any different um, certainly there's variation like everything else but um, they're on about the same hardness scale so you can see here I'm just kind of doing a little bit of whatever uh, and you can see actually it's starting to get a little rough here because of the amount of alcohol that's soaked in there but um, again check out this eye video I'll, I'll put a link for it um, because I sh I'll show you how uh, to get uh, an iris out and and a whole little pupil and everything, get the whole detail. But you can see there. I mean, this is this is so small. If you look at my disgusting thumb that's magnified eight times um, next to that, this is like just maybe two and a half millimeters wide on this eye. And doing this in bass would be just be complete suicide. It'd be so hard. So I'm getting overly greedy in this carving right here, and that that will just happen. Um, it, it is a good idea to have a um, clean toothbrush around for times like this <coughs> because it starts to get all weird in there and um, maybe even a magnifying glass. So here I'm starting to work on the beard a little bit. I'm not sure how much of that you need to see as we've discussed. You can see I've made a few little cuts with uh, the veneer tool from earlier. Uh, but for the most part, I'll just kind of do this S curve with this V tool on over. Um, it's a little bit confusing because um, the grain on this thing is like uh, sweeping in. It, it is kind of like a moon, like it goes out from where the bottom is, then goes into where the face is, and then it goes out again. So it doesn't quite stay straight at any point. And like right here, what I'm trying to do is because this mustache is twisting and, and going over and in I'm trying to make the hairs look like that they're, they're twisting around this kind of uh, peak that's going on um, 
so I don't know again I, I just wanted to put a video out there of kind of going a little further you know um, into some of the detail stuff if you guys want to go past some of these kind of weird little quick um, carvings that I do where I'm just kind of setting up this little magic trick where I can carve something in half an hour it's a very basic face and um, again I just wanted to show you guys the the power of using a slightly harder wood and um, especially sycamore which is something you can get on your own um, one of the other answers to um, you know what do you do about the uh, the wood uh, tearing out is that you can use wood that's not commercially uh, purchased and because the, the commercially purchased wood is going to be um, it's going to be harvested and then put in the kiln immediately so it has no natural drying process and this makes like a huge difference on like the structure of the wood when you start to carve it so if you get like wood on your own or if you get it off of eBay where the guys are finding the wood and then maybe a few weeks later they're putting it into the kiln and it has some natural drying time you'll feel a huge difference um, so again out of the sycamore um, you know it's I don't think there really is any options on, on buying it uh, depending on the country I mean in the US it's like hardly anything at all so but again going back to the back to the basswood if you're having problems with tear outs and stuff try some of the eBay wood and see if that helps you out at all um, it should um, it should cut a little smoother um, I learned about this from the Turners, and it makes a lot of sense because I'd felt it some on my own, but it's so hard to tell because of the the differences in the wood and um, the identification and whatnot. You don't know exactly what you're cutting all the time, and this, you know, look what I was talking about with this sycamore London plane tree problem is a perfect example. Sycamore, by the way, is a maple tree, and um, it's not the maple tree that most people when they say maple it, that's not what they're talking about although the leaves look like a maple if you guys look this up um, you'll see the the the, uh, the bark and you'll recognize it immediately you've probably seen it around it has this very distinct bark um, it can't really be confused with any other tree except the London plane tree and the sycamore but anyway so there we there we go right there you can see that a lot of the beard lines, mustache lines, need to be brought up further with a smaller V-tool uh, so the wings don't get caught in the nose. And um, So there will be some footage here where I'm kind of, I want to make the forehead a little bit bigger and just kind of readjust his face. And this was kind of some of the stuff again where it kind of happened after I would messed up some places and ended up just spending a lot of time on, on the, the carving. Um, Like I've told you guys before, there's um, there's a certain amount of, of learning you can get from these really quick, you know, um, carvings that I do that are like very compact. But then uh, there's also this kind of, you know, I, I want you guys to know what the actual process is like. That it doesn't just happen. It's boop 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 of these cuts. That it's this discovery process of going back and forth and uh, how much time really usually gets spent on stuff. By the time you can do a piece in, you know, half an hour with the exact cuts, it's not going to be fun anymore. It's not going to be um, any kind of whatever. Um, you know, there's this kind of, I have this kind of uh, start to a face that you always see me do. Again, I talked about in the beginning of the brow and the nose. And, um, you know, when I pick up a piece of wood, a lot of times I just kind of do that without even thinking. But after that, there's this, that's where you want to explore you know and just mess around and, and, and take your time with it and, and see how things evolve um, especially after you've gotten a few faces and you feel confident that you can do that um, you know go back in and start to mess around uh, so you still have something for your for your brain to kind of um, discover so this is kind of where the guy is at this point again he's still a little bit wet um, and you can see just the how much harsher the lines and everything are um, he's a little bit crusty because again there's there's been too much alcohol and water on him but um 
you see how those all those the different shapes of the the gouges and the knives they're just so much more distinct than they are in basswood so uh, here you can see and I'm digging out that um, underneath the mustache more which is another good idea towards the end even if you already put the lips in and you put some hair in go back in and deepen that and it'll give you some more depth um, you know go back and deepen underneath the nose or where the hairline is um, or around the face to round it out some more because again after you get a few faces and you feel happy with them you want to explore you know you want to find those other areas alright so here I'm getting towards the end I spent a crap load of time that I've edited out here you can see there there's the uh, kind of uh, veneer tools uh, the shapes going there and then I'm going through there with the V tool a little bit and yeah I think at some point like I had to re I reshape the whole mustache and everything it wasn't even like that didn't even change anything that much it was just um, you know again you start working on stuff you lose sight of things and you just start getting carried away and um, again I, this one I try to I leave this natural roughness on the edge on the sides where it kind of split off and uh, what I do usually with the sycamore is I use a um, I think on this one I don't know I use a um, what's it called I use one of these thinner um, mixes this one's like called the uh, antique oil what's the other one called Hmm. Let me go look. All right, I always forget. It's the tongue oil finish, and it the uh, like mini wax and stuff. Like when it's called the tongue oil finish, <clears throat> it's not really tongue oil. There's maybe like a one percent in there. Basically, with that one, the antique one is, and um, I know there's some others out there. They're basically thinner kind of polys or shellacs where it doesn't leave a whole lot on top. Um, it's basically like a thinned out version and um, it will give the wood that richness that will bring out its um, kind of grain and kind of a little bit more darkness usually um, without leaving this like shiny kind of weird plasticky look on top of it and then but it also protects it so that's kind of up to you um, I've left some of these without them but uh, this is where this guy ended up I hope you guys enjoyed this a little bit. Uh, again, uh, there's going to be this eye video that's kind of unnecessarily attached. There you can see I'm using the antique oil. It's not really a difference between the antique and the uh, the tongue oil finish. The, I think the antique is supposed to be for like a little bit. It's a little bit harder of a finish for like gun stocks and whatnot. But um, it is painted on there. You maybe want to do a second coat at some point. Um, and it'll just kind of even everything out because again as you saw as I was, was shooting this um, it had a very you had a hard time seeing what was going on because it was just shadows and whatnot that the that the wetness was creating and some spots and the dryness was creating so I'll show you some after shots where it's just kind of after this stuff is dried and there's some much more consistency in there just um, some lighting and you'll be able to see much more what it looks like because um, even right now when this stuff before it's dry he looks like a little bit muddy right like you can see he's got an interesting face but it's like again because of the grain because he's wet he's got this weird look and that's kind of a sycamore thing but yeah I don't know I when mean, you look at it up close though it's really beautiful the grain on the sycamore stick a bunch of it in there So anyway, yeah. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Um, again, uh, I can't really tell you where to get this stuff. Um, if you wanted to try some thicker stuff out, um, I haven't really experimented with buying this stuff anywhere. But you should be able to find it. Look it up. It's one of the easiest, um, easiest, whatever the word is, identifiable 
trees. Uh, go look up that bark, and you'll say, "Oh yeah, I've seen that." And and especially the uh, when it's springtime, they get those little they get these balls that fluff out and make these little pods, and you'll recognize those too. And um, hopefully, you'll be able to get some of that. These make great spoons, by the way, as well. Um, this wood. So check that out. All right. So here's some ending images to leave you with. Now you can see the grain up close there. Uh, you see he's more consistent, but in those kind of sidelines, especially, you see those kind of like squares almost um, in those lines. And he has a he has a darker red on the inside of him because that's the inside of this kind of log that happened. And um, you can see his eyes got chewed up a little bit, but again. These are at such a small level that you won't be able to see that in person or anything. Um, so, anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed and carve safe and subscribe and let me know what you want to see. Um, I don't know. Take care, guys. Bye.